Good morning from St. Elizabeth's Parish, Port Natchez, Texas. We're here to do a little scripture study over this Sunday's readings, which come from the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. So we're going to investigate a little bit into the Holy Family and more so into the Incarnation itself. The readings today are from Syrac, Colossians, and Luke. For our opening prayer, we'll say the Hail Mary, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we are now in the Christmas season, and the Sunday after Christmas is the Holy Family celebration. As we see here, there's uh, been artwork throughout the ages of the incarnation of the Holy Family. Uh, as you can tell here in this era, the light of Christ is shown uh, in, in vivid detail where everything else is but uh, illuminated by the Christ child. We have Joseph on the right, Mary in the center, and then it appears we have shepherds and others in the background. Also of note, this year the Pope has proclaimed as the year of Saint Joseph. So uh, hopefully throughout the year we will be able to bring Joseph up throughout uh, the readings as they come around. So I guess before we get into learning the incarnation, it'd be a good question for us to ponder, why would the God of the universe choose to become man? And a part of that is to look at the attributes of God and, and consider all that he humbled himself or gave up in order to become man. So God is eternal, and he humbled himself to become mortal. And as a matter of fact, he suffered and died. So there's a part of that nature of God that is willing to, to give up eternal or eternity. The infinite, so God is infinite, and he became finite. He lowered himself to become a part of his creation. And within creation, it, it is finite. It is a created thing. God was <clears throat> immaterial. So God is purely spirit, takes up no space, but is everywhere. And he became physical, became I guess you would say finite, located in one space and one time. He became physical in another aspect as in a frail and susceptible to all the calamities of this natural world that was created. The God's all-powerful nature, he lowered himself to become weak and vulnerable and susceptible to sickness and death and, and all of the calamities that can await us in this fallen world. So in some way, God became a part of his creation. And so now that we've discussed the ramifications of God becoming man, we can kind of approach the question of why would God become man? The Catechism summarizes four reasons uh, that the history of the church is, is grappled with as to uh, why God would be a part of the incarnation. First and foremost to, to us, I guess, is to reconcile us with God, to save us. So prior to this, we were you know, under the original sin of Adam through one man, sin entered the world, and God had to become man in order for a blameless sacrifice to occur from man. So through one man, sin entered the world. From one man, sin is reconciled. Number two, so we might know God's love. 
this is kind of interesting in that without the incarnation, God had not revealed himself as Trinity, as love. So the, the, the thought of there being three persons in one nature uh, is alluded to in the Old Testament, but certainly not divinely revealed with any amount of clarity as it is with the incarnation and later at uh, Pentecost or, you know, at Jesus' baptism uh, before that. Number three, to be a model of holiness. So by having Jesus on earth as a man live a life of sinlessness, that is the model, that is the goal that we are to attain. Um, and ultimately, that's what we're, we're here on earth for. Number four, to make us partakers of the divine. Now, this truly is a mystery, but in some mysterious way, we will be a part of the divine if we are saved and make it to heaven. In some mysterious way, we will be a part of the divinity. Now we're going to get into the incarnation and what it is. So the incarnation is the enfleshment of God or God becoming man. So it refers to the choices and acts of a pre-existing divine being the Son took in order to become a human being. It's not something, divinity is not something Jesus acquired later in life or even after his death and resurrection. Jesus was there from all eternity. Uh, at the creation, he was there. So even before he became Jesus, a human being, he's always been the divine Son of God. And strictly speaking, the name Jesus only applies to the human being. It is the name the Son of God acquired once he became a human being in the womb of Mary, a name that he maintains to this day and continues to be a human being. That's another interesting point is that he has ascended to heaven and is still in the form of uh, man. He took on flesh, became fully, truly human without ceasing to be fully, truly divine. As we stated in the previous slides, the incarnation is a divine condescension. It is a divine humility to have given up those attributes of God to become man. Now we're going to go slightly sideways here, but I wanted to show what God was willing to give up in, in a different way uh, by becoming man. So the levels of nature or the chain of being, theologians over the years have kind of looked at life and uh, the world and the created universe and, and kind of divided it up into a chain of being. The first level is the mineral or the earth or rocks or things that exist. And as we look, the, as we go up a level in the chain of being, everything has what the lower level has below it, plus one other thing. So for plants, in addition to existence, they have life. As an animal, you have that existence and life, plus the will, uh, that desire for food and, and reproduction. Humans add reason to that chain of being, uh, unique among the, the living beings on earth. Angels add immortality to that chain of being, and God, of course, has the fullness of that, which is perfection, immortality, reason, will, life, and existence. So in order for God to become man, he gave up that perfection or all those attributes of God along with the immortality. So quite a, quite a condensation. What does it mean to be fully human? So as humans, we have limitations of time and space. We're, we're stuck here. We're stuck now. So uh, we can't blast to the future or go to the past, 
contrary to modern movies. We have limitations of knowledge and power. In other words, we, we can't know everything at one time and we can't be all powerful. We become susceptible to temptation, to become mortal. Um, so let's look at the creed regarding this incarnation and regarding basically how the church has chosen to describe Christ. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Here we have several Hollywood depictions and artist renditions of Jesus through the years. So what does lordship mean? In ancient times, lordship meant absolute, undisputed ownership. The Lord was the master. By proclaiming Jesus as Lord, we signify he is undisputed master over our lives. Lord was an Old Testament name for God. What does the name Jesus mean? The Lord saves. And what does the title Christ mean? It means the anointed. The next part of the creed is the only son of God. So why is it stated this way? The only son of God means that Jesus's relationship to God is different than ours. Jesus is truly man and God. So theologically, we're going to use a highfalutin term, is the hypostatic union. Jesus is really one person with two natures. Another mystery we'll never fully understand, but we're here, so let's get into it. Seen here is a graph kind of showing the Trinity. The three circles represent the persons of God, being the persons of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. The triangle represents the divine nature of God. So remember, you have the definition of the Trinity is three persons in one divine nature. And then we look at the person of the sun on the top part of the, the top circle has two things touching it. One is the divine nature of the triangle, which is God. And the rectangle has the human nature. So at the incarnation, we have the union of the divine being God with the human nature of man. So that is the person of the son has two natures and he can act through either one of those natures. So the top three um, acts are those of a human, which are localized acts, uh, learning and limited versus the acts of a divine nature of God or omnipresent. I'm everywhere, omniscient, I know all, omnipotent, I'm all powerful. So that's just a graphical way to represent or to attempt to understand both the Trinity of three persons in one nature and the hypostatic union of there being two natures, divine and human in the person of Jesus. Here's another chart kind of showing once we have defined what Jesus is, a part of the Trinity and having the, the two natures, we needed to, to look at the heresies that developed because this wasn't something that was grasped overnight. This is something that took time to develop, to, to understand who Jesus was. So in the middle is written the orthodox view of Jesus and the thought that he is truly God and truly human. And the squares or rectangles to the sides of those belief systems are the heretical views against the thought of those teachings. So against the thought of a true God, Arianism taught that Jesus was not fully God. Against the thought of Jesus truly being human, Docetism taught Jesus was not human. Again, at the bottom, we have that 
the Orthodox view is that Jesus is one person in two natures. Against the thought of Jesus being one person, we have Nestorianism. Jesus was two distinct persons. And against the thought of two natures, they, of course, thought that Jesus had a blended nature. So this was not a simple question that was easily attained. It was something that the church grappled with and various people got wrong and the church had to clarify through the years. Through him, all things were made. So what, what are we saying here? This is a quote from John chapter 1, verse 3. And it means that the Son was not a created being, and God chose to create everything through the Son. So the Son is the agent through whom all things come into being. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. So this was added to the Apostles' Creed in direct response to the Arian heresy. As we saw earlier in that chart, Arius was a heretic who taught that Jesus wasn't God. So he taught the Logos is not eternal. God begat him, and before he was begotten, he did not exist. So in response, Athanasius taught that Jesus has existed from all eternity in heaven. So basically, Athanasius, at one point, was one of the only bishops teaching the Orthodox understanding of Jesus Christ and who he was. So Athanasius took part in the Nicene Council, which came up with the Nicene Creed and the words you see above. The true teaching is that Jesus has existed in union with the Father, one in being, with the Father. Two things may begin to exist at the same time, and yet one is the cause of the other. One of the examples I've, I've found is fire and heat. So immediately with the presence of fire, you have the heat. Um, the Arians chose a different Greek word to kind of describe Jesus, and it was homo ousion or homo ousion. And that's where we get that extra I, and that's where we get the phrase, not one iota of difference. Interesting. The next part of the creed, for us men in our salvation, he came down from heaven. So this means that Jesus was perfectly fine in heaven. He didn't need to come down to see us. Jesus came down from heaven because he knew we could benefit from it. It was for us men and our salvation. His sole purpose for becoming man was to forgive sins for the salvation of man. He did this through a propitiatory sacrifice on the cross. Prior to this sacrifice and ascension, the gates of heaven were closed. There was no way in. The next portion, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. Here's a good artist rendition, again, showing the light of Christ illuminating all in the picture. So what we're saying here is this addresses how Jesus became man. It addresses the virgin birth. It addresses the incarnation. And this was the greatest work of the Holy Spirit, it is the source of every other grace. So through the incarnation, the union of the human and the divine uh, began, and what was divided was reunited. Now we're ready to get into the first reading, which is from the book of Sirach, chapter 3, verses 2 through 6 and 12 through 14. As an introduction, the book of Sirach is believed to be written around 200 to 175 BC. It was written by a Jewish scribe named Ben Sira, and it is included in the Jewish Septuagint, but not the Hebrew canon. However, it was originally written in Hebrew. We did discover uh, copies of it in Hebrew in the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
So this is one of those deuterocanonical books that the uh, Catholic Church accepts, and the, the book is in the canon of the Catholic Bibles. However, um, the Jewish people at the time after uh, Jesus' death chose not to include it, thinking it wasn't in Hebrew, but as I stated, we did find Hebrew copies in the 1940s from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it closely resembles Proverbs, and one of the key statements in it is, wisdom is the fear of God. So our reading goes, God sets a father in honor over his children, a mother's authority he confirms over her son. Whoever honors his father atones for sins and preserves himself from them. When he prays, he is heard. He stores up riches who reveres his father. So we see a few points here. We'll, we'll kind of go back and forth between the reading and some questions. Um, God sets the father. He defines the hierarchy of the family. I guess that's what it's saying. And then a mother's authority, uh, that the mother does have that authority as well as the father. Um, whoever honors his father and reveres his mother. Again, the, this is alluding to uh, the commandments and honor thy father and mother. And so we're seeing that there's um, an atonement for sins that, that is set about when one honors their father and reveres their mother. Back to the reading. Whoever honors his father is gladdened by children and when he prays is heard. Whoever reveres his father will live a long life. He who obeys his father brings comfort to his mother. Again, we see this benefits of honoring one's father, uh, the fact that they'll be blessed with children and that the, the mother uh, will benefit as well. And the, the less the con conflict there is in the household, uh, the better it is for all involved. My son, take care of your father when he is old. Grieve him not as long as he lives. Even if his mind fail, be considerate of him. Revile him not all the days of his life. Kindness to a father will not be forgotten. Firmly planted against the debt of your sins, a house raised in justice to you. One of the, I guess, corollary arguments for the commandment of honoring thy mother and father is to take care of them and grieve him not. So that the thought is that there will be a time we live in the world um, where everything is mortal, everything is in decay, uh, people die, people die all the time. Uh, God is commanding through these proverbs to take care of one's father, even if his mind fails. And there is there's a gracious benefit uh, that will be planted against the debt of your sins when one does take care of the father and revere the mother. And even if the mind fails of the father that you take care of them. To the second reading of Colossians chapter three. So where was Coloss? If you look here on the map of some of the communities that Paul wrote letters to, it's in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, is where we see the city of Colossae. Also in Asia Minor were the Galatians and the Ephesians, and there in Greece and Macedonia, you can see uh, Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, and then off to the left, you see Rome where all of those other letters were written. The reading goes, Brothers and sisters, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another, 
As the Lord has forgiven you, so must you do also. We see in this first part of the reading um, several attributes that are difficult to obtain as humans. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And also, it's interesting that he says, bearing with one another and forgiving. So a lot of times we feel that people are difficult. People are hard to bear with. And frankly, they're probably thinking the same thing about you, that that you are hard to bear with and hard to forgive. So Paul's exuding us to, uh, me being the first, by the way, but Paul's exuding us to, to bear with one another, to understand that they're probably doing the same thing to you uh, and having to put up with you. Uh, us being very... Uh, centered in ourselves, it's difficult to to have that compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Another key part, he states, is as the Lord has forgiven you. So it's important to understand that, that we come from grace being forgiven, and we need to share that grace to others of forgiveness. Continuing on, and over all of these, put on love, that is, the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ control your hearts, the peace into which you were also called in one body. And be thankful. Dealing with this part of the reading, we see, put on love, the bond of perfection. And you see that it's kind of like we're in other letter, Paul alludes to uh, the greatest of these is love. And we need to be able to love others um, above all. So the peace of Christ and to be thankful. So that peace of Christ is different from peace in this world where there may be violence and there may be um, bad politics or whatever else in this world. But we need to find peace of Christ, which is be thankful and be grateful for the love that, that we have in, in Christ. Continuing on, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father in him. So let the word dwell in you. I kind of see that as um, what we do here, which is we're going to study the scriptures. We're going to uh, dwell on them to allow us allow those readings to to have an effect on us to to have them dwell in us and teach and admonish one another i guess two of the most difficult things probably to do uh, deal with public speaking or uh confronting uh teaching uh is is a difficult thing to do for for multiple reasons but one of them is trying to convey something that can be difficult in an easy manner and and very few people can do that uh, well, uh, myself included, not so much. Um, and admonishing one another. So admonishing the sinner is one of those works of mercy um, that, that Jesus commands us to do. And it also is is one of the hardest things to do. Like teaching is is kind of public speaking and, and, and delivering a, a knowledge. Uh, admonishing the sinner is confronting someone in their sin. Uh, with gratitude in your hearts, and then later down below is giving thanks. So while we may not always have a superficial level of happiness, we can always have a gratitude and a thankful nature that, that can give us the joy, uh, more enduring form of happiness. Do everything in the name of the Lord, 
So give credit to the Lord and do everything for the Lord. Here's a portion that we left out of the reading today for some reason, but it is in the lectionary. Wives, be subordinate to your husbands as is proper to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and avoid any bitterness towards them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children so they may not become discouraged. Again, you know, for some reason, we didn't include this into the lectionary uh, today, but I found that we probably need to look at it at least uh, to read it. And uh, it is in the Holy Scripture, and Paul did write it. So wives subordinate, that doesn't mean, you know, that, that uh, you allow anything to happen in the house and, and, and like, a, like a slave or something like that. But there is a hierarchy uh, created in the household. Uh, husbands avoid bitterness. Um, that you know is is real easy to uh, become flippant or to be unappreciative of what is being provided by the family or your children or your wives. So avoid that bitterness or that thought that. Uh, that not everything is perfect or anything like that. Children, obey your parents. Again, that allusion to the Ten Commandments. Uh, fathers, don't provoke or discourage your children. Um, I see a lot, a lot of times, uh, but myself do it sometimes, which is um, discouraging when when fathers sometimes uh, try a little too hard to encourage uh, whether it be athletic performance or music or anything else uh, our form of encouragement tends to provoke or discourage uh, the child from pursuing things now we're on to the gospel and we see here um, an iconography of Joseph and Mary presenting Jesus in the temple, which is what the topic of this reading is. Uh, you see off to the left, Joseph has the two birds that are required for the sacrifice, and Mary is holding the infant Jesus, pictured a little bit older than he probably was, but that's kind of the nature of the art back. This is ancient art, and, and they kind of depicted these things that way. And then the two prophets that were alive during this story are shown on the right side. Simeon and Anna. So this section of Luke uh, talks about the details of the birth of Jesus. And then it talks about the angels and shepherds coming. And then the part we're reading today, which is the presentation in the temple then the next portions of the verses are the visit to the temple at age 12, and then the final verse in the chapter is describing his growth and maturity. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. When the days were completed for their purification according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer the sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons in accordance with the dictate in the laws of the Lord. So the day of purification, that's just that day that uh, is set aside to bring one, uh, one's child to the Lord. Um, presenting him to the Lord, that was just a Jewish custom that as soon as one could do so to bring him to the temple, and present him and dedicate him per that law. So the law of the Lord is a part of those laws that, that God gave to the Jewish people and Jesus being born a Jew and his parents were going to obey the law at the time that was in effect. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, awaiting the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Christ of the Lord. He came in the Spirit into the temple. So we hear the consolation of Israel. So consolation can mean the comforting of Israel or the redemption, I guess, of Israel. A little history, you know, for about 600 years, they have been an oppressed nation. Babylonians had taken them over in 596 BC. And really, they never recovered from that. They had been freed and allowed to go back to the Holy Land, but other nations after that had constantly oppressed them, whether it be the Greeks or, or now the Romans uh, in charge of them. So that consolation of Israel could have a comforting aspect or even a uh, the thought of, of becoming free of the bonds of these oppressive nations. So the Holy Spirit was upon him and as we see, now that Christ has become man in the incarnation, even though he's an infant, we see the revelation of the Trinity in this reading where uh, the parents, Mary and Joseph, are bringing him to be, bringing Jesus, the Son of God, to be presented to the Lord per the law. And then we see Simeon has the Holy Spirit the third person of the Trinity upon him. So even this early on, we see this Trinitarian presence when Christ became man. Continuing the reading, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform the custom of the law in regard to him, he took him into his arms and blessed God saying, now master, you may let your servant go in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you prepared in sight for all the world, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people, Israel. Let your servant go in peace. So remember, Simeon's very old um, and he was promised that he would see the anointed, the Messiah. And, and his reward is that he can now be reunited with God uh, in heaven. Of course, that will have to wait until Christ opens the gate of heaven uh, through his sacrifice, but that it's uh, imminent uh, to happen. A light to the Gentiles. So we see here an allusion to the, the fact that the mission of Christ is not only for the people of Israel, it is for all the nations to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people as well. Continuing, the child's father and mother were amazed at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be a contradiction. And you yourself, a sword will pierce so that the thoughts and hearts of many hearts will be revealed. So, Simeon here is speaking to Mary, which is interesting because Joseph is there. He's a patriarch, uh, typically would be speaking to the male, but uh, he's speaking to Mary and uh, destined to fall and rise of many and a sign that will be contradicted. So we see here a, a few things that... that uh, a sign that will be contradicted is kind of the the thought that that he will be rejected in in places and with people, uh, and a fall and rise of many, being that uh, you know because of his uh, sacrifice, eventually uh, some will choose to not follow Jesus and some will choose to do so, and those that do not will fall and be separated from God for eternity, and those that do will rise. Uh, yourself, a sword will pierce. So we see an allusion there to uh, the coming sacrifice of Jesus and Mary's participation in that sacrifice and what it will do to her as well. 
There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived seven years with her husband after her marriage and then as a widow until she was 84. So we have a pairing of Anna and Simeon. And I guess one resource I was looking up talked about how there's this pairing of a male and female by Luke uh, throughout the early portions of his uh, gospel. And so that's just something to ponder on. You had um, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, Anna and Simeon, and there was a couple others in there. So if you, you can kind of look at that. And it's interesting that, that he has the male and the female both being prominent in his reading. Simeon talks to Mary and not to Joseph. So we see that, that Luke emphasizes the feminine as well as the masculine. Continuing on, she never left the temple, but worshiped night and day with fasting and prayer. And coming forward at that very time, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were awaiting the redemption of Jerusalem. Worship night and day. So at this time in the temple, there was a court of women, which was kind of an outer court where the women could worship. Uh, just as a matter of, of logistics as to, to where this occurred. Awaiting the redemption of Jerusalem. Again, we're, we're talking about two things here. One of them would be from the five to six hundred years of oppression that have occurred to the, to the Jewish people, and that redemption could be independence from foreign authority. And then also the redemption of Jerusalem has, a, of course, the redemption coming through Christ, coming through uh, the sacrifice of Jesus and opening the gates of heaven. When they had fulfilled all the prescriptions of the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their hometown of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So all the prescriptions of the law, that was the, the two turtle doves and, and present, presenting uh, the sacrifice uh, at the temple and dedicating their son to the Lord. So those were all of those um, Old Testament Jewish uh, law. And being, like I said, Jesus was from a family of Jewish people, then they were going to follow the Jewish prescriptions. So they returned to Galilee and Nazareth, that's just where they were from, grew and became strong and filled with wisdom. So those are two things there that indicate uh, the fulfillment of that incarnation where God previously was uh, always and everywhere had those attributes of perfection and strength and wisdom and omniscience on all knowingness and whatnot as a man he had to grow he had to become strong he had to fill with wisdom it wasn't all there in some mysterious way even though he had the fullness of divinity within him jesus still had the fullness of humanity as well therefore he had to go through the process of growth and strength and learning and the adding of wisdom. So the favor of God was upon him. And, you know, that's kind of a no lie, right? Because you are the son of God. And in a way, you are God being a part of the Trinity. But we see that because Jesus humbles himself in his divinity to become human, God finds favor with that, especially looking forward to the sacrifice that will be made. So we're gonna end today's study with the St. Michael the Archangel prayer, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle, be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. 
May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl around the world, seeking the ruin of souls. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you for listening. Hopefully next Sunday we will have the uh, scripture study in person and we'll talk about the next readings that are there. Thank you.